So I have the pleasure of introducing our next speaker, Dr. Jeffrey Southard. Um, I think a lot of us know him or have heard from him or seen him because he's made it an integral part um, of his practice to try to help and, and, and integrate into our community and help us out. So when we set up for the conference, we usually will send an email asking for a bio on the patient, on uh, the, the speakers. So when we ask him for a bio, he says, just make it funny. <laughs> so then I was flattered. I said, does he think that I'm funny? <laughs> then I thought about it, and I got sad because I, I said, I think he thinks he's funny, and not that I'm funny. Um, so instead of the bio, I asked him for a CV. So what does he send me? A book. Yeah. I think he thought I wouldn't read through it. Um, but obviously I did. Obviously, like I said, a lot of us know Dr. Southern. He's, he's helped out a lot of our programs up here. Um, he did his undergraduate training at UC Davis, moved to the East Coast at Georgetown, where he did his medical school and internship um, and residency, came back to UC Davis for his fellowship and interventional training, and he's stayed there since then. Currently, he serves as the medical director for the, for the cardiac cath and EP lab at UC Davis. He's also the director of the TAVR program, the transcatheter aortic valve program, both at UC Davis and up here at Shasta Regional. He's published hundreds and hundreds of publications. He's authored several chapters and books. He's served on multiple committees. He's investigated in multiple trials. Um, and he's been helpful to our community throughout the years. We know that a lot of us can count on him when we need help, whether it's coronary stuff, whether it's valvular stuff, whether it's life stuff. Um, we all feel very comfortable asking him. And so without further ado, I'd like to present Dr. Souther, who's going to be talking about sudden cardiac death in young athletes, which is a very relevant topic for this year. All right. Thanks for having me back again. I just I'll try not to screw it up this year again, but uh, um, yeah, it's good. It's good to be back. Weather's nice. It's going to be cooler next week for you. Um, I downloaded that Yucca app and scanned what we were all eating for lunch. Um, my water was good. I got water. My water got a got a hundred percent. But uh, I'm watching Sam over there. Sam didn't fare so well with his stuff, but. If you look at uh, you know, the speakers that were speaking before me and after me, that's a pretty good group of people. I mean, these are national thought leaders that you have up here at this meeting. So, I mean, you think Dr. Khan and Khan and Sabina, the planning group, did uh, really an amazing. This is a, an elite level, national level meeting. I'll tell you that right now. <clears throat> so we're thankful for that. I'll be the only guy to screw that up, but what can you do? So I'm going to talk about something different. I come up and I talk about valves all the time, and I thought, let's just try and do something different. I can't beat them down about heart valves year after year after year after year, even though I could do it. Um, but I'm going to do something different. I want to talk more about how, how do we screen. And I, I put this up here just to try and grab attention, but really, we heard about exercise today, and exercise is good, but maybe not for everybody, right? So the question would be is, every time we hear about an athlete that goes down or a young person that dies suddenly, it, it gains attention, right? And the question would be is, is, why does it happen? Is there something that we could do or figure out ahead of time to try and prevent it? Um, and what are some of the underlying causes that cause young people uh, to die suddenly? So before I do that, I have to at least talk about the TAVR program for two seconds, all right? I have to, I came up here at least two seconds, all right? <clears throat> so Shasta Region has been doing it now for, for just over a few years, and the team is very, very uh, facile at doing it with excellent, really excellent results for patients. Um, we've done over 200 now, but now we're at the point where we're doing probably, this year we'll do over 100, 110, 120 just this year alone um, <clears throat> with excellent results. So Jessica never makes any meetings, but she's here today in the back and uh, her, her number is there. It's not her cell phone. I could give you that on the PowerPoint too, but... <laughs> <clears throat> quick referrals, getting people in, people taken care of. They don't have to leave the area. Um, and Jessica's really helped make it happen with everyone else who's here from the cath lab and, and the support and echo and things like that. It's really just a great program. So this is my only one valve slide. It kind of plays into sudden cardiac death, though not a lot of young people die of aortic valve disease. But just remember, 
when you're seeing your patients with aortic valve disease, even if you just look at the aortic valve area, as that aortic valve area starts to get smaller and smaller, just think about those patients and getting them referred to a center that can follow them and help get them treated, okay? That's it, that's all about aortic valves you're gonna hear. So we'll go back to this. So sudden cardiac death in young athletes. Well, there's, there's a few things that I realized when I was you know, kind of putting this together. It's one thing you have to define a lot of things, right? First of all, you have to kind of define what an athlete is. You have to define young, which gets me to my disclosures, right? I used to be an athlete maybe, I think, but based on the current guidelines, I'm neither an athlete nor young anymore. So for those purposes, when we think about the documents, right? And we think about how do we put out there in the literature trying to follow athletes that might have died suddenly, it's usually those that die on the field of competition, right? But what about those athletes that die at home or those young people that die at home with or without exercise involved? And it doesn't also really capture those that have sudden cardiac arrest, right? If you survive your sudden cardiac incident, you're not sudden cardiac death, you're a sudden cardiac arrest. So there's some terms that we'll have to define um, and then we can get to the bottom of some of these things and then try and figure out, are we doing the right thing? Should we be screening more people, less people? Does it matter if we screen or not? And we'll go over some of that. So how common is it? What are the, really the etiologies? And obviously a lot of this came back into play most recently on Monday Night Football this past year with DeMar Hamlin, uh, the Buffalo Bills safety who went down. And I'll show you that video. There's nothing horrible about the video, but you, you will see what happened to him and we'll go over that as well. Okay, but these, unfortunately these things do happen every day. We hear about them when they, when they show up on the field of competition or make the news, uh, but they are happening every day. So here's a few terms to get us all on the same page. If you don't survive your sudden event, it's sudden cardiac death. If you do, it's sudden cardiac arrest. You have to be under the age of 35 to be considered young. We defined athlete. And then structural, right? Something that's actually almost visibly wrong with the heart, either a valve, the way the muscle's put together. Um, you can't really see the electrical system. So the electrical part of it usually tends to be some sort of ion channel that's abnormal within that particular patient that could cause them to have arrhythmias. And then HCM is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy because we'll talk about that in the United States. It's still the number one cause of sudden cardiac death in young athletes. So the incidence is really difficult to assess based on a non-standard definition and how we really follow these patients. And we really don't know what either the numerator or the denominator is. There's also no national reporting, mandatory reporting when this happens, right? So there's no US mandatory, anyone under the age of 35 dies suddenly, you gotta put them all together so we can try and figure out exactly what's going on. So no mandatory registries or reporting in this country. Um, off the athletic field, there's still a lot of things that we follow, right? We still have a lot of athletes or young people that can die at home. And I'll tell you that the problem related to younger patients dying, you could say we should focus more on suicide or drug use than athletic competition. And I'll show you some of those numbers. But they've tried to define how often this happens in the United States and outside the United States. And Italy has done a lot of work on this. Uh, the UK has done a lot of work on this. Um, and you know, we think it's about one in 100,000 younger people in competitive high level competition might have a sudden cardiac arrest. Um, overall in 2009, we thought it was about one in every 250,000 young athletes, but most more recent data would suggest that maybe it's down to one in 43,000. Do we think that incidence has changed? Is something wrong? Uh, is something changing amongst our athletes now? It's likely not. Likely now that we pay attention to it a lot more. Uh, more people are being seen by physicians and, and have to be cleared. Outside the United States, in Italy and the UK, uh, we'll talk that the physician has the right to, to let someone know when they can't participate in sports. And that's not the case in the United States, right? The physician can say, hey, you have this disease or that disease, you can't participate. But ultimately at high level in college and, and pros, it comes down to the physician can't really stop you. It comes down to the, 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 the patient and it comes down to the team that they're playing for to decide is that risk worth taking, right? But outside the US, the doctor gets the final say and if they say you're not fit to play, you do not play, right? There's a lot of money involved, right? A lot of money involved. 
So <clears throat> we know that there's a, a lot of athlete, athletes that do die every year. Um, we know that more of those patients do die during athletic competition than at rest, but there are still a certain number that will die at rest. Um, looking at the NCAA and looking at professional sports, um, you know, more than half of the medically related deaths are due to cardiovascular uh, causes. And most of the time when patients expire um, from a cardiovascular cause, it's with exertion. And we'll talk about why that might be. A lot of the structural related abnormalities are exacerbated with exertion when you try and push yourself. So, you know, Minneapolis has done a lot of uh, work on this, uh, following athletes for long periods of time, uh, trying to figure out again uh, the true number uh, of, of sudden cardiac arrest or sudden cardiac death, and should we do, can we do more about it to try and prevent it? So, we will see as we go along here that not every sport has the same incidence. Uh, between men and women, there'll be differences. Uh, between uh, the African-American versus non-African-American athlete. And we know that the highest incidence for sudden cardiac arrest is in <clears throat> the African-American male basketball player, where the incidence of sudden cardiac arrest and sudden cardiac death is far higher than in other sports, almost 32 times higher than it would be, right? So that's a, if you're gonna screen anyone, if you think about screening someone, perhaps that's where the screening should go. But again, when you get to be an elite level athlete at that level and the potential to have an NBA contract even for a few years looms, disqualifying someone from competition is a big deal. It's a big deal to the patient and, and uh, financially as well. What we need to be sure is that when we start to do screening is that we're not turning people away who are safe to compete, but we should try and figure out who's not safe to compete and see if we limit them. So this was looking at, you know, uh, causes of sudden cardiac death in U.S. athletes over a 10-year period. And Dr. Marin is really uh, well known for his research with regards to hypertrophic cardiomyopathies, pr probably the leading authority uh, in the U.S. and one in the world about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and has done a lot of research up until uh, recently about all causes of kind of sudden cardiac death in young patients and athletes as well. So he would suggest that the incidence of sudden cardiac arrest or sudden, sudden cardiac death is, is not high, and that perhaps screening these particular patients is not the right things to do. It's not the right thing. It's not cost effective, and it's not very effective when we do it. And I'll show you why that might be. Again, when we look about the, the demographics and characteristics of the 182 NCAA athletes that passed away during that time, you'll see that more passed away from suicide or drugs, um, in addition to trauma, all the other stuff that go along with it, than the cardiovascular deaths. So cardiovascular deaths are certainly up there, but there's a lot of other things that come into play. Of those cardiovascular deaths, those that were playing basketball and football were uh, of the highest um, significance. Uh, outside the United States, where some of these sports are not as prevalent, um, soccer tends to be the sport where more people die. And I'll, I'll show you the, the, the Euro 2020 gentleman uh, player from Denmark who had a sudden cardiac arrest on the field as well. I'll show you that. There, it tends to be, not only in the U.S., but outside the U.S., probably nine times more prevalent in men than women. Even with the sports that are being played at the highest levels now in the United States by both men and women, when you look at the number of patients that, that either arrest or die, maybe 10 out of 100 are women, and the rest of the 90 are men. Um, there have been some dedicated studies outside of the United Kingdom looking at that to see what the differences might be. And in 57% of the autopsies of women who died suddenly, they couldn't really find any structural abnormalities. It's called kind of a sudden arrhythmic death syndrome. It's probably electrical related. Um, but almost two-thirds, close to two-thirds, there's no structural abnormalities found in women. So of the cardiovascular deaths um, in athletes and in the general population, if you, if you want to extend this and say, why do we focus on athletes? Well, they get the attention, but the same or more people die outside of athletics in the same age group, right? So should we be screening 
everyone, should everyone who goes to their pediatrician eventually get an EKG or history and physical dedicated towards picking up cardiovascular diseases and cardiovascular causes, perhaps. There's lots of things that go on from the time you're born to the time you're 18, and then when you get to see an adult practitioner as well. So of the confirmed cardiovascular deaths, the question is what, what are the causes, right? We're gonna go over some of these. What are the structural causes? What are the potential electrical causes? And if someone shows up in your office, primary care, uh, primary practitioners, what should we do about it? Should we be asking all of our patients, whether they plan on exercising or not, about some risk factors related to exercise? So if we're gonna look at what really takes out sports-related deaths, cardiovascular diseases are really the biggest thing. And if anyone tells you that they have exercise-related symptoms, exercise-related chest pain, shortness of breath, palpitations, or syncope, it should be taken seriously. <clears throat> one of my colleagues, um, one of our fellows who finished, and, and now she works up in Napa, I spoke to her yesterday, and you know, she said she has a family that came to her. The parents came to her, and they said, we've got to be screened for underlying heart disease. And she said, why? They said, well, about three months ago, their daughter, who was 40, was found dead suddenly. And they said, well, we, we're not exactly sure why. She kind of lived by herself, and no one even knew about it for four or five days. So we couldn't do any blood work to really figure out if it was toxicology-related or what have you. One month after that, their son, who was younger than her, started to complain of palpitations and racing heart and things like that. But he was under stress. He just lost his sister, a lot of other things going on. He eventually said, there is something very wrong. And he got someone to put a monitor on him. And he was having runs of ventricular tachycardia, right? And then they were able to screen him to figure out what genetic abnormality he has. And he has a genetic abnormality. Screened his brother who also has it. Likely the sister has it as well. And it leads to this increased scarring of the, of the muscle. And she likely had a ventricular related event at 40, right? But it was fine up until 40. So these diseases can be progressive as we age, and what doesn't show up at 18 might show up at 35, 40, or 45. So now the parents want to know, what do we do, right? What do we do? We, we probably pass this on. We're in our 60s now. Do we need to be screened? So these, these diseases are out there, right? It's, it's our job um, to try and figure out who might have them, and I just want you to be aware of some of them. I don't want you to be an expert on all of them, but I want you to be aware of some of the structural and electrical diseases that are out there that can increase our risk in the general population of sudden cardiac arrest and cardi sudden cardiac death. The most common of which we hear is this thickened heart muscle, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, right? You have um, you know, representatives and, uh, from our, our first approved medical therapy here, right? Uh, Kim Zios, uh, Mavicampton out there that can treat the initial treatments to, to treat hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and you can learn more about that on the break if you like. Coronary artery anomalies, there's the disease called uh, arrhythmogenic RV dysplasia, where we get fatty infiltration of some of the, the heart, which I'll show you some of that. And then we know myocarditis, just inflammation of the heart muscle itself can increase our risk of heart rhythm abnormalities, right? And this comes into play as we, we have you know, as we make our way through COVID and things like that, there was, you know, myocarditis, myocarditis associated with that, and then arrhythmias associated with inflammation of the heart. And a lot of electrical things, which I'll show you, but I certainly won't talk about all of them. And then on that, I saw you, I showed you commotio cordis, which is what I'll show you what happened to DeMar Hamlin. So when we think about these things, I'll show you a few of the structural abnormalities. And hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is this genetic abnormality. There are multiple different genes involved, usually involving the contractile apparatus of the heart. But the heart muscle itself becomes overtly thick. It can be thick concentrically. It can be thick just at the apex. It can be thick in the mid portion. And the most common of which is what we call septal hypertrophy. So just right below the aortic valve. The muscle itself becomes thick. Patients end up with diastolic dysfunction or increased filling pressures. But the biggest reason this causes problems is, is really two. One, if the, the septum is thick and you become hyperdynamic, the heart squeezes vigorously, you have a hard time getting blood out of the aortic valve, right? 
when we have our echosonographers trying to help us out figuring out aortic valve stenosis, this is subvalvular stenosis. This is an abnormality, abnormality below the valve. If you push yourself too much in the field of competition, you can pass out. And what happens is there's also myocardial fibril disarray, right? So the top is what your normal myocardium looks like, and all the, the cardiomyocytes line up together end to end, and they're connected by intercalated discs to help spread electrical activity from myocyte to myocyte. But when you have genetic abnormalities that cause disarray and you get fibrotic tissue in between these disorganized myocytes, you set yourself up for electrical abnormalities. And these electrical abnormalities lead to ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation. And the more you stress the heart, the more stress you put on that heart, the faster that heart beats, we also have an increased risk of subendocardial ischemia. So you end up getting fibrosis and tissue abnormalities on the inside of the heart. Remember, the epicardial coronary arteries are from the outside. They have to come down and penetrate the, the muscle, the tissue, to get to the areas of the muscle. And the faster that heart beats through the thick, thickest heart muscle, you won't get enough blood flow down to the inner parts of the myocardium. So coronary artery anomalies, right? So the coronary arteries don't always come off in the normal, what we consider normal, in the most common anatomic places. This can happen even up to 1% of the time. I guarantee you there are people in here with coronary artery anomalies, the most of which are benign. You can have them walk around with them. You'll never know about it unless you get either an angiogram for some reason, a CT scan for some reason. We won't pick them up. Then there are people that can pass out, have exertional chest pain, and amongst our workup, we'll be figuring out, do the coronary arteries come off in the right position? or the right sinus, the right, the left sinus, or do they come off in kind of the opposite sinus? Does the right coronary artery come off the left sinus? Does the left coronary artery come off the right sinus? And if it does, does it pass between the pulmonary artery and aorta? And you can imagine that if you've got your left main coronary artery that comes off the right sinus, it then passes between the PA and the aorta. I make it look like there's a lot of space there, but there's really not that much space. And you can imagine as the blood pressure goes up in both the pulmonary artery and the aorta, um, we can cause some compression in this vessel. Most of the time, the origin off of the sinus is a slit-like orifice. It's not round. And you can lead yourself into myocardial ischemia, which leads to VT and VF. So these patients can be surgically corrected if picked up before their first event. And it does take a skilled surgeon to uh, move these vessels around and put them in their normal anatomic positions. So RV dysplasia, I just want you to be aware of this. This is out there. This is actually the, the number one cause of arrhythmia-related death um, outside the U.S. in Italy, in fact. There's a genetic predisposition in both Italy and Greece. And I'll tell you why maybe their screening programs were more successful than ours is because this will show up potentially with an EKG abnormality. So we get genetic abnormalities that lead to fatty infiltration of the myocardium. On the left-hand side, you can see an echo with a right ventricle on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side of the screen, you see an MRI. The bottom, of the, the bottom of the MRI is the left side of the heart. The top of the MRI is the right side of the heart. And that right side has fatty infiltration. What this does, again, predisposes you to non-uniform electrical abnormalities. And anytime you can get non-uniformity in the area of the heart, it can lead to electrical and ventricular arrhythmias. This particular abnormality is exacerbated and made worse by exercise, and disease progression is more with exercise. So these particular patients are told not to exercise, and most of them end up with defibrillators, right? But now you're putting a defibrillator inside of kind of a fatty area. So we have to be careful on where we place them, how we place them, but it's a progressive disease. There's no medical therapy for this. It's really trying to prevent sudden cardiac death and then screening first degree relatives. A lot of times on the EKG, we can pick up this abnormal wave, we call an epsilon wave. It's not always present. We also see a lot of deep T wave inversions and in kind of the anterior leads in the absence of a wide QRS. So sometimes screening, if we pick up this abnormal wave, don't ignore it. It may be the first time that, that you picked up you know, an abnormality that will save your patient's life. And this is routine screening EKGs are done all the time. 
So we have to scrutinize all these things. Just because it's a 25-year-old doesn't mean it'll be normal. So what about some of the electrical abnormalities? Okay, long QT syndrome. So if you remember, there's depolarization of the heart and then has to repolarize, right? And it's all due to all these electrical ion channels with um, influx and efflux of sodium, potassium, calcium, etc. Well, sometimes those channels don't work properly due to genetic abnormalities and it takes us a longer time to repolarize the heart. So we have a between the beginning of the QRS to the end of the T waves, the QT interval. And as we have a longer time to repolarize, we can set ourselves up for arrhythmias. We can set ourselves up for PVCs or other things that can happen during that um, repolarization time and set ourselves up for effectively ventricular tachycardia. So there's these electron uh, ion channel abnormalities that we can pick up. And here's just an EKG of someone that has a prolonged QT syndrome. It can be, you can be born with it, you can acquire it, and some of them are drug-induced, right? So electrolyte abnormalities can prolong the QT. You can be born with a genetic abnormality, or we can place you on certain medications or drugs which alter the QT. And there are a lot of them. There's an entire website dedicated to QT prolonging drugs just to help us figure it out. It's usually when we combine one or two together we get into trouble, or give someone who has a genetic abnormality these drugs that we run into trouble. So what are we looking for? So when we think about the patients who, who did die suddenly, we, and we look back, how many of these people had symptoms that we could have picked up by screening? History and physical versus EKG and echo, et cetera. So some of the patients you know, had a family member <clears throat> that had sudden cardiac death. Some of the patients had preceding dizziness, chest pain, syncope, palpitations, and maybe upwards of a third of the patients. And if we look at some other studies of 162 patients, you know, 92 had symptoms and 26 had a family history. So we might speed through some of the histories and physicals we do on young patients that appear healthy. But if we ask the right questions, we'll pick up some abnormalities that probably deserve more screening. I thought about this. We had a guy yesterday that uh, says nothing to do with sudden cardiac death, but here you go. So just screening, think about screening and following up, right? I think about this because we do a lot of CT scans for all of our TAVR patients and we find nodules, right? We find other things that need to be worked up. And we had this guy yesterday that um, showed up, he's only 75, but he showed up with a ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm. He had been screened in 2017 and his, his aorta was only about 4.2 centimeters there. Didn't qualify for anything to be fixed, but he really got lost to follow up. So just six years later, he shows up, it had ruptured, it was 9.3 centimeters, and it had ruptured, right? So you, it's really, once it already ruptures, you're really behind the eight ball. You're trying to rush it and, and close off the aorta and do what you can. But I think about, you know, kind of the screening of people like that, screening of everything. Just don't ignore what we see in a lot of our scans and make sure they get follow-up. So we should screen. If someone shows up in your office as a primary practitioner, irrespective of their age, Right? We get a lot of people that come in with chest pain or things like that. Right? I have another guy I just saw at the hospital this week. He's 34. He lives outside of Sacramento. And he came down to see us because he wasn't making much progress in his hometown. He's passed out three times in the last month while exercising. There is something wrong with that. Right? There is absolutely something wrong with that. So we'll see. His screening is being done right now before I came up here. He could have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. He could have something. But syncope in the setting of exercise is never normal, and it always deserves a workup no matter who you are or what age. It's never normal. So the question would be is, should we, can we prevent some of these things that happen? And can we pick up things during good physicals? And if we're going to screen, what does screening actually look like? What does it mean? Is it lab work? Is it a full genetic panel on people? Is it EKG, echoes, treadmills, MRIs? We will absolutely break the bank if we think we can just do everything on everybody, right? We will not be able to do, healthcare is already so expensive in the United States, we won't be able to do everything for everybody. So the question is who do you screen and what do you screen them with? Well, the current practice and guidelines by the American Heart Association is in the United States is to do history and physical, right? So most of the time when we're screening high school athletes and or college athletes, um, we're not doing a great history and physical to try and pick these things up, right? Um, I always get asked, not locally, usually in my neighborhood when, when my, my girls were younger, um, 
It'd be the last second, right? Oh my God, I got it. I, my kids are playing softball. They're playing baseball. They're playing basketball. We didn't get their physical done. Can you run over and just sign the form real quick? And I, I always tell them, I go, listen, I will come over, but I'm going to listen to their heart and lungs. If there's something wrong with any other part, don't, don't blame me. I'm not checking everything, right? But there's this, there's this young man who's, who's a, a good friend of the family, and he, I'd never you know, examined him before. And he's 15, right? And he's going to be playing high school baseball. And I said, I, I said Nate, I got to at least listen to your heart. You know, his dad's watching me, and I'm kind of listening, and I'm listening for longer than he thinks I should be listening because he has, a, he has without question, an aortic stenosis and aortic insufficiency murmur, no question. So I go, well, he's got to get an echo. He has a murmur. And I was trying to tell his dad what it is, and they're like, all right, can you play? Can you play? And I go, I mean, I understand where patients are or where families are and things, but, you know, he has a bicuspid aortic valve. So he has a two-leaf-foot aortic valve, and he already has aortic stenosis and aortic insufficiency with it. Doesn't mean he can't play baseball, but he needs to be followed, right? This valve will fail him early in life, and he'll have to have a valve replacement. So telling a 15-year-old that, not, not a great thing to do. But many other people have listened to his heart before, right? So I always tell our, our docs, too, listen with the intent to hear something. So despite screening that might go on, we still hear about these things all the time, right? And I didn't, there's, there's no prevalent, prominent female athlete that's been in the news any time lately to add uh, her to the slide. So I put some of the other the men that have died suddenly. You can see there is an African-American predominance. Some of these things are, are um, unpredictable, right? And I'm gonna go over some of these cases with you about how some of these elite level athletes die. And for those of you that are older like me, you'll remember some of these <laughs> athletes. But so what about Hank Gathers? Hank Gathers was a, a basketball player for Loyola Marymount. And he was the leading scorer in 1980 to 89, right? He led the NCAA both in scoring and rebounds, which hasn't been done for a long time. He had problems with near syncope three weeks before, right? He got evaluated uh, by one set of doctors who said, hey, you probably have this hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you shouldn't play. He got evaluated by another doctor who said, no, 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 his, his syncope is, is not related to that. He can keep playing. So he, you know, they uh, have a great team this year. And uh, he, routine game, completes a dunk, celebrates with his teammate, and just absolutely passes out right there. There's no defibrillator or AED at the court side at this time. The people that come to try and help him out are not really sure back then what are they dealing with. And you can see all the videos of no, no real CPR. And what you see after minutes later is them kind of carrying him out on a stretcher. But no AED, no CPR, nothing's done. And he doesn't survive, right? So that came to national attention because Loyola Marymount ended up making it you know, to the Elite Eight that year, a very small team playing in his honor. But that could have been prevented, right? So Reggie Lewis, so Reggie played basketball at Northeastern, makes it all the way to the NBA, right? He's already been playing for six seasons. So why would something happen after that? Why one day and not the other day, right? So he gets an exercise treadmill test done um, a few days before, uh, actually within a, within a few weeks of this game, and he actually does okay in his treadmill test, and they tell him, you can, you can play, right? He has near syncope during a, a Hornets game, and it looks like he's got hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. They still let him play the rest of that year, and he actually died during that summer just during a practice game. And then eventually it was found to have kind of a dilated cardiomyopathy with extensive scarring. And these things, this is the hard part, right? These things don't show up all the time. And they don't show up early sometimes. So Pete Maravich was an NBA all-star. And he played his entire career with a single coronary artery. Wow. Right? He had a congenital absence of the left main coronary. Everything came off the right. Single coronary. So this guy considered one of the 50 best basketball players ever in 1996, one of the youngest ever to be in the Hall of Fame, right? And he dies playing a pickup game in Southern California after his NBA career. So part of what we have to figure out is what's, what's the risk? I mean, if he had been playing now, the amount of financial um, stability he would have gained for himself and his family by playing is a lot. Um, so there's a lot of finances behind this, and there's a lot of unpredictability, right? He played an entire NBA career without having any problems. 
right? This is recent. This is in 2020, right? This is outside the United States. Christian Eriksson out of Denmark. This is um, Euro 2020, just coming back into play. He is just throws the ball in after a side out. He's walking by himself on the side and he passes out. He's lucky one of his teammates runs over, rolls him on his side to make sure he doesn't choke, and then gets the medical personnel out there right away. And he had VT. They luckily shocked him on the field of play and then took him into the locker room, and he actually did, did well. This is the impetus. What happened after this is the impetus for what I'm about to show you for the Buffalo bills Demar Hamlin game. They decided, as a group, Denmark was playing... Finland, I believe. Don't quote me on that. It's either Norway or Finland. I think Finland. They got together as a group. Everyone's still in the stadium. They wait a few hours and decide to continue to play the game. Right? So then they finish playing that game. Denmark loses. But there's a lot of controversy around, should we have really just played that game or should we have stopped? And I will tell you, that's what came into play during the Buffalo Bills decision to not continue to play that Monday night football game. So I'm going to talk about DeMar Hamlin here and what commotio cordis is, right? It's the sudden blunt impact of the chest that can lead to uh, ventricular arrhythmias, usually ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation. It's not a high-speed impact. There's also something called contusio cordis, which is where you get hit hard by a steering wheel, by an airbag, by something going 40 or 50 miles an hour, which causes absolute damage to your heart, okay? So... What happens is if you get hit at the right time as your heart is repolarizing, you will go into VT or VF. And a lot of the work was done in swine models to try and figure this out. So within 40 milliseconds, right? You have to, we're down to the millisecond being hit in the right place to the right millisecond can put some people into VT or VF, which will require immediate resuscitation. And this is what happened to him. It's more common in baseball than it is in other sports. Um, and it has to be just at the right time. And you might not be predisposed. DeMar Hamlin's been cleared to play. He will play next year, right? He's been cleared to play. He's gone through many workups. And I'll let this play here for a sec. And his tackle and his hit is no more vicious than anything else, right? This is a routine tackle, routine tackle. And down he goes, right? This is, this is no, no helmet. It's like a shoulder pad there. Nothing remarkable about this. And then once you have no blood pressure, you're going down, right? Now, they came to their senses and decided this is enough's enough. We're going to stop this, right? So the question was, is, you know, can we prevent this, right? Can we do some things with focus, history, and physical? Can we do some things with EKG to try and prevent this? Well, we know we need to screen people. The Italians have come up with a way that they have more RV dysplasia picked up EKG abnormalities, and they were able to decrease the incidence of sudden cardiac death from 3.6 per 100,000 to 0 0.4. And it's very, very marked reduction. We have not been able to do that here um, in the United States. And Dr. Marin has done a lot of work on this. And he, he found that you, even without EKG screening, the rates in Minnesota were comparable to those in, in Italy with ECG screening. So will this help us at all in the United States, right? The populations are different, but look at how high their sudden cardiac death rate was in Italy before screening and where we started in the U.S., potentially because they have so much RV dysplasia. So he said, you know, routine history and physical done well will get us a long way. EKG may or may not help, but only in the right people. And I talked to you about, you know, males dying uh, more than females. And I'll get through a lot of the times the data that we've got surrounding history and physical and EKG. If you do a good history and physical, you'll pick up some things. But of the patients that had issues, a lot of things would not have been picked up by the history and physical. You need an EKG and or echo or further workup to be done. So a lot of the uh, long QT syndromes, abnorm abnormalities in the electrical system would really be picked up on EKG or stress tests. So I got a minute or two left here. I'm, I'm going to forward through. So the biggest key for us to be able to actually make, um, make an impact is with defibrillation. I'm going to tell you this here. So the biggest reason that we can really help um, 
this is just so I went through some screening things, is if you have AEDs, right? If you teach people how to do CPR and you have defibrillators readily available, the time at which it takes you from that time that that athlete goes down or anyone, right? Anyone in the stands, if you think about the number of people that are there, this is, you know, 59 cases of sudden cardiac arrest. 18 were student athletes, eight were other students, four were officials, three were coaches, and 26 were spectators. So if we're really gonna try and make a difference, we gotta teach CPR and have an AED. It's not just the athletes, right? We have people dying in the stands all the time. So teaching CPR and having AEDs is really gonna be the key rather than robust screening outside of people that have symptoms going into that, okay? So a lot of responders, if CPR is provided, it's provided quickly, patients will survive. You go from sudden cardiac death to just being a sudden cardiac arrest in which you survive. Every minute or two there's a delay, the chance that you survive or come back goes down substantially, right? So if you have an AED on site, uh, when a shock's delivered on, on site, 87% you know, will survive. Schools that don't have it, only 44% are gonna make it. So the single greatest factor is early defibrillation, right? So this is gonna be the key. How do we get enough? That's why you see them in airports now, right? You see them, you have to think about in your mind, could you use it if you were asked to use it? So we should probably all learn a little bit more about the AEDs and how to use them properly, um, how to start them, plug them in and things like that. So, and I told you about exclusion from sports, right? The doctors in the US can't exclude you from sports. Outside the US, they can. So there's different guidelines, right? So the cost of screening and things like that, the cost of universal screening would be billions of dollars a year to screen just our young athletes. And it's not something that without great data to suggest in the US that it will prevent something, won't be done in the US. So the barriers are limited access, lack of really medical oversight, liability considerations, right? If I tell you, you can't compete and you were gonna be an elite level athlete, am I liable for your financial future? If I made the wrong decision, if I let you play. So it's really, it's kind of muddy waters here. So there's some false positive things associated with this. So I'll go over to my summary slide. It's really, if you're seeing younger patients or any patient that matter, who's gonna exercise and start that program, um, we're all, remember it's okay to be overweight but fit. Just don't be skinny and not over, under, you know, unfit. That's what we learned from my exercise talk today. <laughs> So I was talking to Ozzy before, I said, I'm just gonna eat what I want, but try and stay in shape. That's my, that's my new motto. So history and physical for everybody. If you pick something up, do more screening, EKG and echo, and go from there. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sather. Obviously we enjoy that talk, very relevant to what we've seen the last couple of years. Questions? Yes. Is, how is he able to play? Did yeah. He, I mean, is that something be a concern? Like, if you have a defibrillator, shouldn't play contact yeah, sports? Yes, that's a great question. So Christian Erickson, when he went through his screening, he, um, and again, you can try and get, get online and try and figure out what they thought his cause was, and you really can't find it. They didn't tell you if he had hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. I can tell you that it's unlikely that he has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, RV dysplasia, or a structural abnormality, or they would probably not clear him to go back. He probably had sudden cardiac arrest. They couldn't determine the cause. He gets a defibrillator and he gets to play football or soccer, right? Um, but he wouldn't be, he, we wouldn't be allowed to play NFL football with his defibrillator. Um, I, I, I can't even tell if they gave him a regular defibrillator or a subcutaneous device. It's hard to figure out anything, even from all the, the searching that you do. But he has been cleared and has been back playing. And now he has like an ankle injury this year or something that put him out. Um, in the U.S., our guidelines for who can play with or without a defibrillator are different than outside the U.S. Um, and if his doctors clear him to play there, he gets to play no matter what. But inside the United States, it's, it is different. It's different insurance-wise, and it's different uh, for who gets to compete at the highest level. So when someone's been given the diagnosis of hypertrophic um, cardiomyopathy, what limitations do you put on them for physical activity? I mean, if uh, some of the athletes you quoted, like Reggie Lewis, got a lot of scar tissue in their heart, 
Do you tell them to keep their heart rate at a certain limit, their METs at a certain limit? Just like you said, previous lecture talked about how important it is to stay fit instead of laying around on the couch all day. Yeah, and that's a very good question. And it's, it, I think it's a moving target from where it is, where it was before to where it is now. And Dr. Marin and his son now uh, has kind of taken over that, that role as, uh, as studying these particular patients. We used to say that you could do you can do some physical activity, but not a lot, right? You could play doubles tennis, but not singles tennis, right? That's kind of how they delineated how much exercise you could do. You can play doubles, but not singles. They would not want you to play high-level basketball. Could you shoot around in your front yard? Yeah. Can you play football or soccer? They would not let you uh, exert that much. They're changing things around now, but what, what does happen is you do get myocardial fibrosis and subendocardial ischemia and things like that. It depends if you have obstructive physiology or concentric LVH as well. But we tell people um, no high level exertion, uh, like you know, uh, playing competitive basketball, they would not want you to be able to do that, or football, or really competitive soccer, they would have you step it down from that. So you're not gonna be reaching, we don't want you reaching 80% maximal predicted heart rate, you should be staying down towards 60%, 50%. But those guidelines might change coming up soon. Yeah. Um, I'll give you a little more insight because I was one of Reggie Lewis's treating oh, there you go. cardiologists. Okay. Okay. So you've got the real data there. Yeah. Right so um, the problem was that he had more than one diagnosis. I see. And his treating physicians in Boston were misled because he had a tilt table test in which he went flatline for 16 seconds and passed out. Wow. So they blamed his syncope on the vagal effects yeah, of the company athleticism. And unfortunately, he had another problem that you alluded to yeah. that led to his demise. And so one of the problems is you can be led down this garden path of saying, oh, it must be this, when in fact it was something else. And, and that's, that's a lesson that we should learn from, for all of us when we treat patients. That's insider. That's not out there. That's good. Now we know. I can change my talk now. That's good. Thank you. One of the problems with screening EKGs is the anxiety it creates. If this is just a slight abnormality, the anxiety the parents start going through worrying about their kids is another problem. And most of the time, it's usually normal, nothing to worry about. Yeah. Any other questions? change they did your screening so you, I, like the Ericsson you know I mean he's been on different teams he's been every time they they had to do like a, I think it's a cardiopulmonary pulmonary exercise test that they do so you think age has something to do with it how do how does they miss it on the uh, treadmills yeah a lot of times it's random too like and we had up until um, when the Kings had kind of changed their contract we used to stress test all the NBA players and things like that every year um, and things can still be mixed. Usually the structural abnormalities won't be missed nowadays, but some of the underlying genetic ion channel abnormalities will be missed. That's probably what he has, is some sort of non-EKG or echo-based diagnosis that led to arrhythmias. And again, why that day compared to another day? Was he more dehydrated, electrolyte abnormalities, a secondary insult of some variety on top of his genetic abnormality? And we know screening, it's not perfect. No matter how we do it, it's not gonna be perfect. And that's part of the reason why screening hasn't changed in the United States. It goes to history and physical, and then further work up beyond that. But it, it won't be perfect no matter what we do, at least not yet. Yeah. Basic question. Uh, no family history of uh, sudden death. Doing a physical abnormality, teenage kid, nervous about having a physical. What pulse rate prompts you to? Yeah, I think that's, uh, I think it's interesting if, if we, we know that the normal rates in that particular patient should certainly be way, way under 100. Um, if there's anything over 100 for sure, if there's any abnormalities to the pulse, irregularities to the pulse that could be either PVCs or arrhythmias of some variety, get an EKG. Um, it's quick and easy to do. So I think if any time, if you're thinking, hey, this is not quite right, it's easy to get it done right there in the office, I would think, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Jeff. You're welcome. Thank you very Thanks, much. Thanks, my pleasure.